Would you like me to, or do you yeah. want to? <laughs> All right, we are going to transition to the second part of our uh, session today together on the IB Primary Years Program in our elementary buildings. All right, we're ready to begin. Good afternoon, my name is Jen Service and I am the Elementary Curriculum and Instructional Specialist for MPS. And I am joined today by our two amazing PYP coordinators, Robin Harshman Rogers and Whitney Jacobs. We are here today to share our journey with IB. And also we are living right now in the moment of the evaluation process. And we will go into a little bit of detail with that. Next slide. So our journey to date, uh, we started embarking on our PYP journey way back in 2013. Um, and to give you a little bit of history on how far we've come, between the years of 2013 and 2015, uh, we were embarking on what we call our candidacy phase with IB. We broke the phase into two groups. We had our phase one schools and our phase two schools. Um, just to really get acclimated with the program. As far as what the candidate phase means is that we were um, assigned a um, representative from IB that came to every one of the elementary buildings, met with the coordinator and teachers, and really outlined what the program is all about to set us up to apply for candidacy. So between 13 and 15, all six of our schools went through that process. Between 15 and 17, um, we became authorized IB World Schools. Back in pre-COVID days, an authorization visit was in person. It was over the course of two days where IB evaluators visited each school building. Typically, that's between two and three visiting visitors for the team. Uh, they would spend time not only with the coordinator, but they would spend time with grade level teams. They spent time with principals, with administrators, and really evaluated the program within the school. Um, happy to say that between 15 and 17, all six of our schools became authorized IB World Schools. After that, we were given a report, things we were doing great and things that we needed to work on or make improvements in. So between 17 and 19, we implemented the action plan, created those at the building level, had focus areas to work on, and we just really planned our program for growth. So now where we are today between 19 and 2021 is the self-study process. How have we done over the course of the last five years? What do we need to do better, make improvements on? And we are gearing up for the evaluation visit, which we'll go into a little bit of detail in a few minutes. Um, now that we're in COVID times, the evaluation visit will be full virtual visit. Next slide. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, currently there are 1,893 IB World Schools. 602 of those are PYP schools within the United States. 25 of those are PYP schools in Michigan. Six of those 25 are Midland Public Schools elementary buildings. That means that 25% of Michigan's IB World Schools offering the primary years program are our six elementary schools here in Midland Public, which includes the pre-primary center. Next up, I'd like to introduce Robin. And that's kind of, that's kind of a really big deal for us to be 25% of Michigan's IB World Schools offering the PYP. Um, one of the things that we find as we ta start talking about PYP, especially in the community, is what is it? What, what are the components of it? I know that one of the things that I struggle with and sometimes still do is like when you're in the grocery store line and somebody says, what's your job? And I say, I'm a teacher. And then they'll say, what grades do you teach? I teach all of them. Well, 
What school do you teach at? Well, I teach at three of them. <laughs> Well, how does that work? Well, I teach teachers, and then, you know, that's just, a, that's just an, one opportunity to make a connection with someone in the community. And I found that when we were talking about it within our buildings, there are so many facets that we all think are so important that we needed to really find a way, like, if we had a three-minute elevator conversation is what we called it, what would you say to somebody to explain the work that you do? And that's, that, that's a big task because there are lots of components and pieces of the PYP. Essentially, it's, I like to boil it down to it's a framework of best practice. And so this slide shows you what we did at, on opening PD is what is PYP. Kind of gave them the IB verbiage. And IB has its own language. So you have to learn how to decipher that. And then we took what were the big ideas from those. Um, and what would be talking points and highlights, and we bulleted them out for staff. And then we asked them within their grade level team to create, in your own words, what would you say? These can be places that you can have that conversation with someone new to the school, a parent when you're describing your um, parent at your parent night. It can be the grocery store line person or whomever. So to kind of give you an example, we have two here that some teams wrote. And what we did also was after they wrote these, we gave them back to them and, and it, we shared everyone's. So if you needed a blurb for um, the communique, if you needed a blurb for a newsletter, if you needed a blurb for just a talking point at a conference, you had a wide variety of things to talk about. So one example is, IBPYP is a student-driven way of teaching and learning that's led by students' questions and inquiries. We work to develop internationally-minded students through engaging lessons that focus on collaboration and conceptually-based units of inquiry. PYP fosters student agency, which is voice, choice, and ownership, and exploring, questioning, and experimenting in their world. Those are pretty powerful things. Um, and you could, we could spend a whole day just talking about that one piece there. And another example is the Primary Years Program is a school-wide system that promotes inquiry and 21st century thinking through engaging, hands-on, and student-driven units of inquiry. The, learner, the program promotes building global citizens through the learner profile attributes that students examine and strive to develop in themselves. They are encouraged to be risk-takers, well-balanced, open-minded, caring, reflective communicators, inquirers, knowledgeable, principled, and thinkers. And that last bit was are all the components of the IB Learner Profile, which is at the heart of all that we do in PYP. But it's also the part that transfers from PYP to MYP, which is the Middle Years Program, and then to the DP, which is what our community was more traditionally used to talking about was the DP program. And in the beginning, we did have some misconceptions of what does that look like at elementary versus the high school. And I, the biggest difference is it's for all students. So everyone in the elementary school is engaged in PYP, which is a really powerful thing. Okay, next slide. So as I said, the learner profile is at the heart of the PYP. And there are 10 attributes. And really, I feel like IBPYP is a really amazing combination of what is the art and the science of teaching. You have all of the components, the inquiry best practices, which is the science. And then you have the art, which are the things that um, allow students to express themselves, become better people, we say. We strive to become more knowledgeable, that we have a common shared humanity, that we are internationally minded people. And when you say that, you think, oh, well, that means we're going to learn about Germany. Well, internationally minded doesn't mean it has to be across the ocean. It means it has to be on your world. So beyond you as a kindergartner, beyond you as your classroom, beyond you in your school, beyond you at your home, in your community. So all of those components make up being an internationally minded person. And those 10 attributes are goals. And we don't all possess them at the same time. And we're in varying places and different times in our lives, in our learning, and in our work. 
I'm still working on the balanced one. <laughs> um, and this all came, this work came the year I was born, and if I'll date myself a little bit. That was in 1971, so they just had their 50th year anniversary, and so these things have held true for the last 50 years, I think, because of the strong components of best practice and the beautiful way that it does combine the art and science of teaching. Okay. So this is another example of something that we asked our teachers to do. Um, an, a large component, and you even heard when we were talking about NWEA, about agency, which we defined in, in PYP as having voice, choice, and ownership. Another part is reflection, and as I was reading our examples of PYP, the part I think we missed in there that we'll have to review is that we didn't include teacher agency in there. And that is a huge component because it is not PYP. When I started, I was in phase one original and went to a conference and I had no idea what they had just told me. They were speaking a foreign language to me. So I'm a learner. I go looking for the manual, the binder. Where is it going to tell me what I need to do and how it works? And it isn't there. And at first, that can be frustrating, especially if you want to know how to do it. And we have a lot of amazing teachers who all want to do it right. And the thing with IB is that the agency lets you decide what is the best practice, not the best practice, but what works best for you within your classroom and your school. So having that kind of power to decide what kind of units you create, what are the components, what, are your, what is your focus, is a really powerful piece. And that is why, in the beginning, makes the teachers very angry that we all, at all the six schools, did not write the same planners and we just share them. And then I say to them, okay, so you want me to give you a planner and you want me to tell you this is what you're going to teach? Well, no. Okay, so you want to have a say in what you're creating? Well, yes. But, but, but I think as we wrote the units and we've written them and rewritten them, there's six units for every grade level. They're all under the same theme. And as we've worked over the last eight years with these units, part of the reflection of the self-study for me was when we're looking back at things from 2015, as the coordinator, I was kind of even saying, let's just throw it in the box. Like, I mean, just, we'll just do the best we can now. We kept saying we'll do better when we, we can do better when we know more. And, and so we kind of went with that philosophy. And so reflecting as a 2020 planner to a 2015 planner, the growth is incredible in our teachers and what our understanding of PYP and in our students. Um, I think the agency is a really powerful piece that sometimes we overlook. And you'll hear that. I think it's our new word in education. So for this piece, the digging deeper, Part of PYP also that is a strong piece is the self-assessment and goal setting for yourself. And so when we develop PYP PD, we always model what we want teachers to do within the classroom. It's always a purposeful activity that they can then take and apply in their classroom. So this was a place we asked teachers to walk the walk. So we're asking kids to do these things. We had all, These are all the strong pieces foundational pieces of PYP on here, like collaboration, concept-based teaching and learning, inquiry and questioning, strong transdisciplinary units of inquiry, relevant, significant, and challenging learning experiences, meaningful assessment of teaching and learning, approaches to learning. Those are the skills that we use to learn, such as communication skills, research skills, and authentic connections to our auxiliary classes, agency and action, and creating a culture of thinking. And we pulled these pieces from all of our reports. So we had six reports after our first authorization and became IB World Schools. And we looked for commonalities. What were commonalities in areas that we needed to grow? So those growths are called recommendations. So these were the similarities because they're things that all PYP schools have to work on. So not only did we say, here, these are the things that we need to think about this year as we design units, work with students, make plans. But now look at this. Look at what you think you're strong at and choose two things that you really want to focus on because, as we know, there's overload to what we can take on. And so taking on two things for the year that are going to be your focus and your goal 
and then checking in as we work through the planners throughout the year. And I think that has been a powerful piece for them to not only talk it with their students, but then walk it. Yeah? I think, yeah, I think it's up to Whitney now. Thanks for laying the foundation, Dave. Is it okay if I move over here? Okay. All right, as Jen mentioned kind of at the beginning, our current um, place in the process, I guess, would be what we're in, which is now self-study and evaluation. So self-study, we started that journey last year, although it was greatly interrupted by COVID. But self-study is intended to be a year-long process. So we did start it last year, um, and it has a couple goals. So one of them is reflection, looking back on the past four, five, six-ish years, depending on what school you were in, if you were in phase one or phase two, and providing that opportunity for all the stakeholders to reflect. So not just the staff, but we're asking for input from our parents, from our students, to say, here's where we started, what are we doing really well, what have we really grown? I feel like Robin, when she was talking about um, starting the program, we all really dove into the learner profiles because it was something we could grab a hold of and that we could, you know, embrace with our students. And to look back as a teacher who was writing these planners with our coaches and our coordinators to see how far them that we've come is really um, quite impressive. And then it's also looking back and celebrating and celebrating with with IB and collectively to say yes, we did focus on learner profiles and look at our units now. We started off with science and social studies, trying to in embed those and make connections, but now we're embedding reading and writing and maybe we can pull some math elements and make all of those connections under some big concepts. So uh, that's, that's another thing that we've uh, appreciated looking back on. And then lastly, we know that we have areas for growth and this has been a process that has allowed us to see Really, when we're looking at the IB standards and practices, okay, we've fallen a little short, you know, maybe with ourselves and IB, and we need to set some priorities and put some actions into place to grow those areas. Next slide. So here's just a visual of what our process has looked like. We started last year. Essentially, IB provides us with a questionnaire, and it has all of the IB standards and practices listed. And what we are tasked to do with our staff, and again, we've brought in student, some student and parent components with this, but looking at each individual IB standard of practice and rating ourselves. So, Robin, can you think of a standard practice off the top of your head? She's the standard practice queen, so I'm going to... Um, including diversity and inclusion into units of inclusion. Including diversity and inclusion into our unit planners. So... The team that would be written for them, we've used a lot of um, Google Forms so that we can do a lot of this collection of data, if you will, um, virtually since we have had some um, restrictions due to COVID. And the team is going to then have to task themselves looking at their grade level or individually. Uh, could you click to slide, sorry, Ann, would you click to slide um, 10? Oh, right there, no, you were on it, sorry. So based on that standard, they had to provide their input. Do they feel like their team is emerging with that? And it goes all the way up to excelling. And then what we did as coordinators is once everybody provided their input, we gave an overall score, and that went on the questionnaire, which was part of an application. Would you go back one? Back, there we go. And we'll touch base on that in a minute. But basically, um, how many standards and practices did, did our staff about 62. About 62 standards and practices we had to rate ourselves on. Um, through the, the collecting of the evidence, we, or the collecting of the questionnaire data, we've had to, not only we're asking teachers to rate themselves, but then we're saying, okay, that's great. You feel like we're demonstrating on that standard. What evidence do we have to show that we're putting, uh, embracing DEI with our, within our unit of inquiry? So not only just saying, yes, we're doing really well, or we're not doing so well, but what do we have to show that supports that? We, we've collected this. Again, it was we started last year through grade level meetings, through some questionnaires, through interviews, 
And we submitted that to IB. For phase one schools, we submitted our applications and our questionnaires this past fall. So our phase one was Woodcrest, Adams, Plymouth, and Chestnut Hill. They will be having their um, IB team visits for their virtual visits this spring. So between March and May, we'll have four schools. Um, we'll have a visiting team from IB come, come virtually. And our phase two schools, which would be Central Park and Seabirt, we will be submitting our questionnaire and our applications this June with visits in the fall. After the visiting team comes, which we'll, we'll dive into the team visit in just a few minutes, they will provide us with a written report uh, to which we will have some commendations, some recommendations, and hopefully no matters to be addressed, but we will revise what we call our action plan, which just says, uh, here are our IB standards and practices, and this is what we've done so far, and this is what we implant, or plan to implement in the future to be able to make that growth. Next slide. Uh, keep going. We threw this one in here. The, the premise of self-study and evaluation is really what they call an appreciative inquiry, which is not to so much focus on what we're not doing well, but instead what, celebrating what we are doing really well with the underlying um, notion that we do need to make changes to be able to grow as educators and as people. Uh, go ahead, Ann. Yeah. I would just add to that the reason we, we tried to, to choose and find a quote or a way to explain the self-study and evaluation process. It's about more than just those PYP people are coming to check on us. So we need to make sure we're checking the boxes and doing all the things. Okay, you could look at it that way, but if you're really looking through a PYP IB lens, you're looking at growth over time. And that's one of the reasons we keep portfolios for all our students is because what is a better piece of evidence than to see a kindergarten reflection from a unit of inquiry about how we grow and change to a fifth grade reflection about infection detection or, or revolution or whatever and to see the progression of how have I changed as a learner? What do I know now that I didn't know? Mm -hmm. um, so to look at it as that inquiry piece, which is the foundation of PYP, and for teachers to kind of shift from just these people coming to let's look and reflect and find out what we can do better. And that I think sometimes we do feel like it's an I gotcha instead of that we are partnered with an organization who, who does value and support us with areas that we do need to grow. So it's more than checking boxes. Um, as we said, we do have our evaluation visits coming up. Our first one is Chestnut Hill. We will have, uh, I just learned that our team is made up of two people so far that will come uh, virtually for our evaluation visit. So when they come, it's again, appreciative inquiry as Robin just spoke to, really just being able to celebrate our strengths and our successes for our implementation over the past five years. And just a genuine curiosity of where they can support, what are we doing really well. Um, I don't know if I want to add anything more to that specific one. Um, I do want to talk about the, the state, all stakeholders too. I think this is a nice piece that this process, and, I, and Robin has more experience in this, but it feels sometimes like it's just general education teachers, but really it's, it should be our entire community. We are IB World Schools across six buildings. We, we have DP um, schools for our high schools. So it's been a nice piece where we can all ask ourselves what are our contributions been? How are we developing learner profile attributes in our students? How are we developing the skills um, that the IB lays out for us? Are our lessons inquiry based? Are we using the language that Robin talked about in our communiques? And are we showcasing that we are an IB world district almost, right, with the exception of our couple middle schools? So it's really been kind of refreshing to look at it through that lens. Um, and then the last part of the, the evaluation, and I'll talk about what that visit, what we think it's going to look like in a second, but. Um, 
is it's, it's given us some really clarity when we're taking and looking at all of those ratings and how we scored ourselves. It's become very clear where teachers are feeling like they need more support. So for Robin and I and Jen to be able to provide uh, professional development and be able to see that those holes in our program um, do exist and what, what we can do to make those better. Anything you want to add, Jen and Robin? Okay. Okay, some of these we just talked about. Self-study, like I said, that's kind of the process leading up to the evaluation. At the end of this year, all six of our applications will have been submitted. What they ask is that each coordinator, you submit three choices for when you would ideally like your visits to occur. I think we've kind of gotten our first choices-ish. We've tried to spread them out a little bit so that we're not all at the same time. Uh, Chestnut Hill will be in March. Plymouth will be in April. And then uh, Woodcrest and Adams, their visits will be in May. The virtual submission, um, as part, since the visit is virtual, normally we would have three days where the visiting team is not only meeting with teachers and administrators, but they would be walking around and being able to see the culture of your building, if you will, looking at what's hanging in your classroom and talking with students, and that's not the case. And so to prepare for that this year, we've asked that teachers give a virtual journey of our of PYP through the last four to five years. And so this has been kind of some incredible work put on by teachers. This has been all on their own time, you know, with that combined with professional development to build what we call a virtual bulletin. And so they each team kind of took this on. They put in photographs. They've put in video clips of them teaching, their students engaging. And Anne, would you, we're just gonna sh show an example of one grade level at one school, how they've showcased their journey. So this is a fifth grade team at Adams that um, Marianne Lepofsky and I, we talked about, I said I have this long document from IB. It tells me all these components I need to have for this virtual visit because when I did it the first time for authorization, I had my beautiful binders and everything was printed and I had all my communiques stuffed in there and all, it was and like, here, just, just look. just do a slow click through while Robin's kind of, is that okay? Yeah. Here's, a, here's my binder, but how am I going to do that when we're going through Zoom or how am I, I going to be able to show? So we came up with this virtual bulletin board idea and then made a template for everyone so that they could use it as is if if that worked for them or make it their own. And so we asked them to put in images with captions. And so they, this is in progress. So um, these are some samples of student thinking, um, showing charts, the thinking that goes in the classroom during the unit and teaching. Bulletin boards, this is one connected to where we come from, our identities, our heritage. And all, when you see those headers, those are the themes for the six transdisciplinary units that we teach. This is, um, they had to modify, they, in fifth grade they do um, some connection to the Holocaust and what that was like and being in a cattle car. And so usually they take them on the playground and they make, a, they make it the dimensions of what it really was and they stand in there. So obviously for protocols and safety that's not possible. So with some creative thinking, we found some ways to take that activity and make it safe, appropriate, and still impactful for students. And the one thing I will say about that this year, you hear all the, but we can't, but we can't, but we can't. But what I'm starting to hear more in my meetings with teachers is, you know, even though we usually did it this way, because we couldn't do it that way, this way is actually really better. And that's a really powerful <laughs> forcing thing. Forcing some <laughs> Yeah, it's forcing some change. change. And, reflection, yeah. and some of that's been really positive change. Um, we ask for a lot of student reflection. Reflection is at the core and the heart, right alongside, I think, learner profile. Because if you're not reflecting and trying to better your practice, you're not growing. So we ask, we ask students to do it all the time. And we honor who they are. We put in their things that they identify with, we make it about them, as many connections to them, so that they can go take those and journey in the world. So we won't take you through all these. I think some grade levels had as many as like 75 slides of things that they wanted to showcase. So 
which is really powerful. You can click in a little, if you don't you, mind, just clicking a little. So this, so connections to um, project lead the way. Had to do that differently because this unit pa patient zero. It's all about taking <laughs> taking some secret gel in your hand, and you're going to shake all these people's hands. Obviously, not really able to do that. But what was the other side of that is they had real life happening that they could connect to. You can go back to the other slide, sure. And I don't think we probably have time to. Yep. But just gives you an idea of what, what teams have put together. Our virtual visit will consist of a three-day visit. Um, we will be, they will meet with all of the grade level teams. They will meet with auxiliary teachers. They will meet with administrators at the district level and the building level. They will meet with parents during that time for that building. They will meet with a group of students. And we will even be doing live classroom visits. So they will be able to see teaching and learning in action via our cell phone or tablet, whatever we're using while they're there as well. Just to you know, get a feel for, again, the culture of the building and what do the, our IB standards and practices look like at Chestnut Hill or at Adams in practice. And then lastly, Robin, you can just briefly about, we'll get a report back. Well, as having gone through it several times, um, you, at the end of the meeting, at the visit, you have like a sit down meeting. And they don't tell you what's in the report, but with a listening ear, you can hear what was a positive, what is maybe going to be a recommendation, and what might be problematic. So you kind of have that in your mind. But then in about, it just depends on the timing. We were, had our visits in March, mm -hmm. and by the end of April, beginning of May, we had received a report back. So we're hopeful that even if we have a May visit, one at Adams, the last, the first time, we got it on the very last day of school. So it just depends, and they'll give us our feedback, tell us where we are in the process, and what we need to do moving forward. So uh, another part that we've been tasked with this year is how can we combine DEI and SEL work into PYP? And for us, it's just naturally part of what PYP is. And so for this year, because things have been hard and we try to model, again, what we want our students to be doing, we ask teachers, because we have grade level meetings, and part of grade level meetings is it's a time to reflect, and it's not always great things. You know, sometimes these things bog us down, and even find we found that in ourselves. And so how can we flip that and make it positive? So we ask everyone to choose a word of intention, something that you could reflect on throughout the year that could kind of ground you, um, tying in those DEI SEL pieces too. So if you go to the next slide. So we also because we model, we use the thinking strategy to do it, and we've kind of flipped it on them. So we asked them to choose a word, and so this is an example. Her word is begin, and part of that thinking strategy is to choose a phrase from maybe a text, but we asked them to create it. So she, her phrase is small steps to bring new change. And then her sentence was to begin, begin. And so we're taking those and we're posting them in our building so that not only are we honoring students' thinking, but we want students to see that we're doing the work too, and here's examples of our thinking. And so that, that I think that will grow our, our culture in that way. And the two pictures are examples. Whitney and I have our word. Our word is freedom. And we bought our bracelets from a company that's called Little Words Project. If you're interested in that, it's a very powerful thing. <laughs> They register, so if I needed to give this bracelet to somebody who I thought needed some freedom, then you could track it across the world, which is very PYP-ish. <laughs> and here is, that's a, another example of someone who was inspired to find the exact bracelet she wanted with her word, which is grace. Some of them put them in frames in their classrooms. And so to see that take hold, and then it's a great thing to also say, remember, your words begin. So let's begin. Or I, we say to ourselves all the time, remember, freedom. Nope, let's let that go. So these are the ways that we're kind of honoring teachers, their thinking, and, and modeling it for them to use with their students as well. So hopefully that gives you um, a small glimpse into our journey with PYP. And um, 
to end with one of our favorite quotes. It is good to have an end to journey toward, but it is the journey that matters in the end. And what a journey this has been, and we are excited for the future of MPS with PYP. Thank you, and we'll take any questions if there are any. <laughs> so that is the middle years program, and we have explored that two or three times in our careers. Um, Mr. Jaster has been involved as a middle school principal, and it is very engineered, and Robin and Whitney weigh in if you have something I'm saying wrong, please. I, I and, have a comment when you're done. Okay. And we've had difficulty figuring out how it fits into the American system and maybe the mi middle and public system as well. So it, it may have the... Um, problem of shoving some of our um, co-curricular activities, uh, um, eliminating them or reducing them in the scope as well. And so we've not been able to figure out that piece of it. But I think the question Sudi's may be asking is the connection to IBPYP in the middle year so we don't lose that momentum to the high school. And, and again, I think we've done some things but are working on that maybe where you have a comment. Go ahead. And we and we and along the process have you know kind of partnered and I know you know Dirk who's the principal at Northeast he, you know he said if I could do one thing to support that what would that be and I, making thinking visible strategies and routines because that's something that once they know them you, they can use them from kindergarten until they're in twelfth grade and my famous example my partners will hate to hear it but. I have two children. I have a senior and I have a freshman. And one of them is a PYP kid. And one of them is not. And the differences in how they think, how they problem solve, is incredibly different. So my children this year are doing hybrid. And so for my student who is non-PYP student, she is amazing at it. She can task through the task, go through. I know what I need to do. I've, I've done this in school. She's also had amazing teachers along the way, so not taking anything away from that. But my younger child, who's a freshman, she knows the skills, but what she's missing is the connections, the conversations, the things that she, so she's ready to take it to the conceptual level rather than the factual level, and that we don't always find that. And so there's just a difference in our kids who go through PYP, and it's, and, I t try to tell people, I know there's that gap, and it, in a perfect world, it, there would be no gap. But what I can tell you is the skills and the thinking and the processes and all of the work that we do in elementary school, it does not disappear. It becomes part of who they are. And I think with that foundation with the Warner Profile, inquiry, conceptual thinking, and then having them be in charge of their learning, I don't think it matters if they're a kindergartner or 12th grader. It still will carry. Hopefully and we, that answered Sudi's question, but, um, you know, I like to say anymore, I've been around this education <laughs> business a long time, and it is the most powerful thing I've seen of affecting kids' way of thinking. So it's an exciting program. And we have had some um, conversation with middle school principals as well um, about infusing that learner profile language, you know, throughout to bridge that gap. And I have been part of a team, and I, I don't remember the, all of the members, but we have done a little bit of work with middle school and professional development. Talking, We had some rotations, if you will. So one was learning how they can use the learner profile in their language in their classrooms. And then I don't actually remember what the other rotations, but there has been a little bit of work trying to bridge the, the gap, at least using the vocabulary. Any other questions, Cindy? Dan, you have any? You look like you do. Um, yeah, just wonder for, for teachers that you would say, so called veteran teachers that have been teaching for quite a while and then adjusting to the, the PYP, has it been a, a real um, rough loop, a complete new mindset for those teachers, or has it been a really big adjustment? It's okay to say yes. Oh, well, I will say, I will say this. Um, I think some of my most improved players, I'll use my sports analogies, 
are those people who were resistant in the beginning because I like yes. the way I do things. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for 15 years. It works for me. My, I, I have success. And then to, and why are you making me do this? And why are you making me fill in all these boxes? To now, and when I say boxes, I mean boxes in a planner. <laughs> um, I have my own lesson plans. I don't need that. To now see those people being a leader of a team, shifting their practices and saying, maybe that wasn't what was best. Maybe I didn't need to give out a packet. Maybe they could create their own model instead of me doing the work for them. I think it's been uncomfortable, and we've honored that and said, you are not the sage on the stage. I, you know, you can say you're your guide on the side. I like to say you're a meddler in the middle because you need to be in the middle of all of that to kind of guide it. And what, when you shift to that, for some people who are used to being the sage on the stage, I'm the giver of everything, that's uncomfortable. And it has taken some people a, a longer time, and some people were just ready for it. And, but I do find that you know, new people coming in, they have, they're at a disadvantage because they haven't been here the whole time. But those veteran teachers are strong leaders for them. They support them. And I think our teachers who are new coming in are just like, sure, this is the way we do things. OK, we're ready. So um, it's been really nice for me to reflect about maybe some grumblings I heard in the beginning that now I, I aren't a part of conversations anymore. And Dan, I think to the, just to that point, the beautiful thing is has much reflection as embedded within this framework that now going through the self-study and having to put these slideshows together to submit virtual evidence, I think teachers have been really reflective and been able to see how far they've come since day one. So that's been pretty awesome. If there is no...